<laughs> okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the work session for uh, April the 9th, 2024. We're going to call the roll. Alderman Barnhill. Present. Alderman Potts. Present. Alderman Caesar. Present. Alderman Peterson. Here. Alderman Berger. Present. Alderman Baggett. Present. Alderman Vice Mayor Brown. Present. And Alderman Blanton. Here. And the mayor's here, too. So everybody's here tonight. Uh, the next item on the agenda is opportunity for citizen comments. I have uh, two speaker cards that wanted to speak on number three, but I'm going to ask them to speak now because item three is strictly about process. It is not about any specific projects tonight. So I have uh, Clem Fisher and Samantha, Samantha yeah. Fisher. Uh, so if you'll come up and uh, I'll give you two minutes each. <coughs> No, ma'am, you need to come to the microphone, please. You can sit here or you can go to the podium, whichever you want. If you sit here, you got to push the green, yeah. the button until it turns green. Hi, I'm Savantha Fisher. I'm a native of Franklin. I grew up on Franklin Road, actually two houses away from the mayor's wife. So he... and. When I was growing up on Franklin Road, I could ride my bicycle down Franklin Road to Earl's Fruit Stand and ride back. And had no pro and then the speed limit on Franklin Road at the time was 55 miles an hour. And there was no traffic lights until you got to First Avenue, okay? And my mother was the head nurse over the emergency room. So if it was dangerous, you think she would let me do that? No, it was safe. I live on Eddie Lane. I can see Pinkerton Park from my front door. I would challenge all of you to come to my house and walk with me to Pinkerton Park anytime you want to. Because there's not a safe way to walk down Eddie Lane. And it's like this coming Saturday, you're going to have an armor day. And there's Pinkerton Park, it's going to be, the parking's going to be limited. And yet, no one on my street has a safe way to walk there. And none of the streets off of that, there's two, two streets that are uh, dead-end streets off of Eddie Lane. It's not a safe way for any of them to walk there. And that you're cutting down on, your, on that situation for that. And uh, it's just one of those things we would like for our street. To, it's funny, behind us, Ralston Lane has sidewalks. Liberty Pike has sidewalks. But the people who live on Liberty Pike, if they want to go down any lane, they don't have a sidewalk. And we're just asking to have safety. My oldest son used to run down the street, and he almost got run over. And he was a ranger in the Army. So we're not talking about someone who did not know the safe way to run down the road. Okay. And he was in the Army for eight years as an officer. And I just, I'm just asking for a safe way for me to get. Well, thank you. And we'll be considering those capital projects. Is, is Clem your husband? Yes. Did he want to speak? A wise man would probably say ditto. <laughs> but, uh, you go ahead and say what you want to, Mr. Fisher. I like you. Thank you. I need to press anything. You're good. Okay. I've been a resident on Eddy Lane for 19 years. Um, since we moved there, um, I walk regularly on the street on a regular basis, two or three times a week. Um, you wouldn't believe all the examples that I have of how I've been treated as a pedestrian on that street. I mean, I've had people come by and wave at me like, I have no rights at all to even be on the street. You know what I'm saying? Um, like it's for motorists only and pedestrians have no uh, rights at all on that street. I've seen uh, families pushing strollers and the family would have to get off the uh, street because there's no other place to go. The road is so narrow, two cars meeting, you know. Um, they would either have to get off in the grass or hopefully stay in the lane of traffic and hope that the traffic would 
be courteous enough to uh, to get over in the other lane to let them pass. But the way uh, some of our drivers are around here these days, that would have happened when we were growing up, but not now. I mean, people, they, courtesy doesn't seem to be a, when you're in your car, you're invincible, you know, whatever you want to do is my perception of it. Traffic laws, like the other day, I was coming back on Margin Street and uh, I had the light, the green light to go on out in 96. Well, one car, they were kind of on the edge there, you know, like uh, the light was turning, going to red. Well, then another car, the light was completely red and I was green. I had to sit there and wait for them to make the turn or, uh, you know, stuff like that. Just, it's just not a, not called for. Anyway, um, our street really needs something. Anything you all could do, we would greatly appreciate it because uh, the people around there, myself and my wife, we're not getting any younger. And, you know, 20 years has already gone by and we, we appreciate any help you can give us, you know, widening or sidewalks or anything that would be available. We would uh, greatly appreciate it, uh, us as well as our neighbors, you know, with the factory being redeveloped in downtown yes. and all We're that. We're going to have to cut yeah. you off. Your time's expired, but That's we appreciate right. your comments. <laughs> That's all Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Mr. Mayor, I have one comment. Go you ahead, Alderman Burton. Uh, in light of that comment, I was just wondering if our streets department, uh, by the way, I feel your pain. I have that in my own ward, and uh, we're looking at city projects. And I know Ralston Lane and Liberty Pike, when those roads were developed, they were required to put in sidewalks. And Ralston Lane's been here a long, or uh, Eddie Lane's been here a long, long time, so probably didn't have sidewalks at those times. But I was wondering if our streets department might have a sign that we could put up along some of these roads that we're having problems with that are in our um, CIP projects um, that we want to get to eventually, or sooner than later, hopefully, uh, that says watch out for pedestrians. It might help. I'm just saying, I'm just asking. We might want to look into that. Just because sure. in those roads, people do walk. Thank you. Thank you, you Alderman Berger. Uh, we'll now go to item one, which is police compensation plan. Mr. Stuckey and uh, Chief Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, we wanted to put this first off. We're starting with an important issue. And uh, Chief is here to assist me in talking through it. Uh, this is a discussion that, that is probably a little ahead of the normal order. This is the type of thing we might typically fold into a budget. But it's something we have uh, identified as significant concern, both within our staff team uh, and looking at the market overall. So wanted to present that to you tonight, get some feedback, and talk about a way forward in terms of uh, how we compensate our, our, our police department team and how this fits in the market and how we uh, work going forward to make sure we're in the most competitive position we can to attract and retain the very best uh, in serving our community and public safety. So just to talk a little bit about the context, as you know, when we developed the fiscal 23 budget, we made significant investments in updating our compensation plan and being highly competitive in the market. Uh, it, it was successful in doing that, and we invested significant resources. In that budget alone, we put over $8 million into pay adjustments. To put that into context, a typical budget has around $3 million in pay adjustments. So we made significant adjustments there and followed that up in 2023 with an additional $1.3 million that was targeted at um, the compression issues across the organization. Uh, so collectively between those two elements, well over $9 million in adjusting our compensation to make sure we were in a highly competitive position. And at that time, that was true. And over half of those dollars went into the public safety realm, police and fire, to, to ensure that. Well, the reality has been in the last 18 months in particular, that market has shifted within our region 
and I would say across the country in a lot of ways, as the labor market in public safety, specifically in police, has become highly, highly competitive. Uh, this is an issue uh, chief and the police department leadership had identified, human resources had identified, leadership within the department identified, and conversations uh, started several months ago about how to examine that, understand it. The board brought the issue up as well. Uh, we spent significant time at our first Budget and Finance Committee meeting in, in February talking about that concern and identifying that it was a top priority as we, we developed the budget. Uh, we engaged our compensation consultant to get data. Our HR team dug in with extensive research, research beyond that to understand the context of what other competitors in the region were doing and are doing uh, as we move forward. So that is kind of setting the table for what we'll talk about tonight. The current structure as we have it, we bring in a trainee at about $50,000. And then when they reach their, uh, through their probationary period and advance from the trainee into the police officer position, they come in at, at just under $54,000 is an adjustment that's made at the end of, of um, probation for those folks. We have hired more and more laterals, so we developed, have developed a sort of sliding scale from one year up to 15 years that brings uh, already post-certified officers in anywhere from 55 to 65,000 per year as a police officer uh, uh, position. So that's that's one piece of it, and that's how it's approached right now. There are some other important elements in the compensation formula that I just identify for you. We do pay a, a shift differential and have enhanced this just within the last oh, six months or so at the chief's recommendation, where there's a 7% bump for the second shift, and then uh, for midnights, there's a 10% shift differential bump there. We do pay special operations stipends for those who are selected and step up in, in certain specialized areas. You see those as part of the element. We've also introduced a shift differential for those who are subject to being on call, meaning they are have to be ready to respond to certain uh, needs. And so there is compensation up front for that, as well as um, payment for when they are called into service at that time at a, um, at a time and a half basis. There's also, uh, we did also enhance special events pay in the, in the recent time frame as well. And so let's look at some of the data, how this compares. And our current benchmark when we have done the compensation plan is for us to be at least in the 75th percentile or better. So we're in the top 25% of the cities we compare ourselves against other employers and make sure we stay there or better. That has been the target for the last 10, 11 years in our compensation plan. And this chart just sort of compares where those numbers are today <coughs> compared to that target. And you see generally, uh, we are still hitting that target when we look at those numbers. Uh, with the, the area of, of greatest concern compared to that in the, in the trainee and police officer one area. So then we also compared that to uh, the actual salaries of folks. So not just the pay scale, but the actual salary of folks. And it's, it's somewhat similar, especially for the trainee and police officer one. For officer two and up, uh, it's a little better than the, just the pay scale comparison. The actual pay of folks is, is, a, is a little stronger there um, when we, again, look at the 75th percentile benchmark or target. So here's the, where we start comparing to specific employers across the area. And when we looked at this two years ago, we were very much on the left-hand side of this chart. We're now in the middle to the lower middle of that chart. Um, there are some differences in, in how pay is structured within different departments. There's also different schedules. You'll, you'll notice the ones with asterisks work 12-hour schedules, so they're working more hours at likely a lower hourly rate than we're paying, but total compensation or, or pay at the end of the day is uh, larger because they're working more hours. So that's just one of the nuances to, to how we compare. This is that entry level, that trainee pay, and you see where we are right now. You look at officers at one year of experience, so once they've cleared probation and they are um, post-certified, this is where they lay out a, you know, in, that, in that lower third right now uh, in terms of the, the most recent data that we have. 
When we look at our lateral range, that 10 year level, we, we slide up a little better in comparison. So this is somebody at 10 years of experience at uh, a little over 60,000, probably 61, 62,000 range. Uh, so it's a little more competitive there. And then when we look at, whoops, went a little too far. When we look at that 15 year, so the very most experienced lateral officer, that's at 65 and that puts us pretty much at the top in that realm. So again, this compares shift differential. We are more aggressive with that shift differential, which is more common for a newer officer, either lateral or trainee, or they, they are more likely to work those shifts. So there is more compensation provided there than, than some of our, our competitors. Uh, that's just a, a note in terms of how pay is structured. Um, when we roll it all together, when we look at shift differential, the various other incentives, whether it's uh, on-call pay or um, the, the special operations components, and we try to roll it all together, you see us kind of in the lower part of the upper third of this group um, as a point of comparison. But again, that base pay is, is lower. That base number is, is lower. When we look at top out, we're just over 85,000 for the top out of a police officer. And again, that, that puts us kind of in the middle of this range uh, with uh, four competitors in, in this group uh, higher than us. And then when we look at uh, paid time le leave that we provide, so a combination of vacation time, personal days, holidays, sick time, when we roll that all together, the city is, uh, of Franklin is actually uh, most competitive in this area compared to the other uh, jurisdictions that we look at in the region. So bottom line is the market has moved away from us pretty significantly, especially as it relates to trainees and police officer ones within uh, that base salary component. When we look at, uh, at that component, uh, we, we do better with the experience in the laterals, um, but, but when we look at entry level, we're not where we need to be or where we want to be. Um, and, and so that, that's a concern. Uh, we do rank better in some of the other elements when you look at shift differential, the stipends that are provided, paid leave, those elements. So it's, it's a mixed bag, but the base pay is, an, is a serious concern and, and why we're talking to you tonight. So let's move to what the recommendation is and then we'll show you how that rolls through and, and changes the competitive position. Uh, this shows you where we are and where we would move to. We would move the trainee pay, that entry level, from 50 up to 60. The lateral, we would move from a sliding scale, this 55 to 65, to just a straight 65. If you're post-certified and you're a lateral officer moving in, everybody's going to get the same treatment and be at, be at 65,000. We would also then uh, adjust pay grades throughout the organization. So not just the entry level, but we look at PO2, MPO, detectives, uh, sergeants, lieutenants, and captain ranges all moving up a pay grade. And with that, a 3% bump for everyone. And then within police officer two, it'd either be a 3% or a move to 65,000. Uh, depend, whichever would be greater. So we just make sure that at least a minimum they're at that comparable number that a lateral is getting for a post-certified officer. So this is really the heart of it. Um, and then we'll walk through some charts that show you how this shifts our, our, us compared to the market. Looking at entry level, the trainee position, we now move at 60 to the top of the list. And the only competitor that is meeting us is at Bowling Green, which is a 12-hour shift department. So uh, I think this puts us in a much higher uh, position in terms of that competitive market. And you see how that rolls through compared to everybody else we're looking at. When we look at the lateral, the 65,000 likewise puts us highly competitive. We've got uh, Highway Patrol and Bowling Green are, are equals there. Uh, but then again, still highly competitive and uh, don't have the 12-hour shift compared to Bowling Green and mm -hmm. THP has mm -hmm. some other um, elements in terms of how, how they work and the, the likelihood or possibility to, to work essentially anywhere in the state of Tennessee compared to working in a specific jurisdiction. 
Yeah, so uh, the, the ones with asterisks work 12-hour shifts. So collectively, they're working more hours over the course of a year, and they're getting some overtime pay that helps them reach a higher compensation, but they're working more hours. Our, our folks work typically work 10-hour shifts on a 40-hour week basis. Now, doesn't mean there isn't overtime and other things that come up, but that's the baseline. So it's a more um, conducive shift to balancing your life, et cetera, and those elements that, you know, uh, we, we briefly experimented several years ago with a 12-hour shift, and it was not well received. Let's just put it that way. Did I say that? Nice enough? Is that okay? To, okay. Be, to be clear. <laughs> you see some uh, response. To be clear, there. Eric, yeah. the total number of hours worked in Franklin are lesser yes. than the total number of hours worked in, say, Bowling Green. If you were on a 12-hour show, exactly. Your, your scheduled hours are less, fewer. Um, so uh, th that's part of that. And it's a, we think, a more conducive schedule to officers being fresh, sharp, ready to do their job versus a 12-hour shift. And that was the experience we had when we experimented with it for about a year and a half, I think it was. So, uh, any other? Good. Okay, we'll roll through the rest of this how it how it compares. When we roll the other elements of potential pay, shift differential, other incentive benefit type components, uh, we become uh, the clear uh, top competitor uh, versus this market group and within the region overall. Uh, top out pay, so when you look at the full range of from day one as a trainee all the way through the very top, uh, you know, uh, 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 rank in terms of a police officer, uh, police officer two element, you end up uh, over 95,000. So that full range, we also are at or near the top there as well. So we're not just talking about the entry level, we're talking about the full course of an officer that might choose to work patrol throughout their control, their career at the city, this would give them a lot of room to, to grow financially as they serve the community. So same exercise we did with the other charts, let's compare it. And now we've added a new column, which is the new target. So moving from 75th percentile to a 90th percentile target. So, uh, and this would be something I would propose we move towards as an organization. So uh, we would apply this not just in public safety, police and fire, but we would ultimately look at moving it to, for the whole organization and make that the target that we work against when we compare our compensation. So comparing that, you see how are we doing right now with this structure compared to that 90th percentile, and you see we pretty well hit that mark um, with the adjustments that we've made. Uh, compared to that 90th percentile. So we raise the bar and how do we compare against it? And you see we're, we're largely meeting and exceeding it. Uh, police officer two is a little bit unique um, in terms of how we have structured it. And, and it, 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 it is not in place in all, all departments. So it's just a little bit of a difference there. But, but globally we are, are um, performing well when you look at those medium ranges compared, the median of the range compared to um, that new market target. So let's take the, sorry, the uh, comparison again to the actual pay that people have and would have in place and compare it, roll it out, and uh, you'll see that we again compare favorably with these adjustments to the new market uh, target that we have set. So in summary, we would increase the pay um, across all pay grades, and that would put us in the top echelon of the market. We would hit the new target of 90%. We would also provide more range and room to grow for folks who may be topping out at every rank, because we will move pay grades and provide a bump within that and so you create more room to grow as careers progress, which is also healthy. We want good people to stay here and see an opportunity to grow in the department, both, both professionally, personally, and with the compensation we provide. This would put us at or above the very top of the market and would refresh a, a, a new target for us at, 90, at the 90th percentile. Uh, again, it put us at top tier for entry level in PO1 
It would also, uh, the, the lateral approach I think will be healthier for us overall, both in terms of competitive position, but also as those laterals come in and compete, I think this will, will um, be a little cleaner in terms of what they do moving forward, uh, that they're sort of at a, a, a similar position of, uh, as all of our post-certified officers. And as they compete and promote, you don't inadvertently create compression where you didn't have it before or a, a comparison issue of, well, I've been at the city longer. Why is this person making more at promotion or at some other point? So I think it eliminates that issue uh, as well and, and puts us in a healthier position. What are you saying does that? I'm sorry, because that's my concern. Is but, so that, that lateral piece by treating all laterals the same, as well as our own, once they get post-certified after a year, everybody is at that same starting point as a post-certified off officer at 65,000. New officers or, sorry, if they're a lateral, that. if they're a lateral, they come in post-certified. Understood. They would end up there, which is the same place as a starting point. Any of our folks, once they're through probation and are post-certified, would be at that same starting point. <clears throat> so and right would now- Would there not be any exceptions to that as far as training and different, that's if same. they have, you know, SWAT experience or if they have well if they have that and they get onto those special units they would get compensation for okay. that so that would be addressed that way but it really creates a place because right now with the sliding scale and a sliding scale that goes beyond where we put people once they're post certified you can have a scenario where somebody's been with the city for a relatively short time even though they have other experience compared to somebody who's been with the city a longer period of time and so you have a little disparity there this sort of levels that playing playing field. So the can bottom I, line. Can I ask? Yeah, sure. What does post certified entail? What what does it all entail? Well, we have a, a post commissioner right here to talk about it. So, because <laughs> I think we need to know yeah. what all that entails. That means that they've gone through a uh, an academy that's approved by their state. Of course, in Tennessee, it's the one in Donaldson, and they have completed. Usually it's 12 to 15 weeks of very intensive training, okay. and they're certified by their state as a professional law enforcement officer. Okay, so that makes them become then post uh, uh, certified for our department. Yes, Okay. post is uh, police officer standards and training. Yes, okay. And Chief Faulkner is appointed by the governor to that post commission. So, so she serves that for the yeah. state of Tennessee. Okay, thanks. So the bottom line, the, the cost to do all this, uh, in, in an annualized basis, in, in, if we did it just for the new fiscal year, would be $475,000. Uh, so that, that's not cheap, but the department has also done a calculation. The cost to replace an officer is $129,000. That's not counting a vehicle or any of that kind of stuff. So you do the math on that, and three and a half officers, four officers, and you're there. So uh, that, that's just the reality of it. And that's why enhancing our competitive position is really important. And uh, you know, I want your feedback on where we go with this. If you're comfortable with this, I would suggest making the adjustment now, like within the next board meeting cycle. And so that we can start to address that. Uh, we're you know, recruiting right now for officers, getting that information out and making that part of our package, I think would be really important. There are a couple other things that are still ongoing. Um, I wanted to get this in front of you, but we're not solving every issue that we're working on. We're still working on some things. So I want to be clear on that. And I, I guess the, the strategic decision I made in bringing this to you is instead of trying to solve everything, Let's get the most important things in front of you and get direction. And we'll keep, keep working on these other elements that might play out in the broader budget as we move forward. First of all, there's been a request from our team, uh, some of our, our police uh, team members to look, and fire team members as well, to look at a separate pay plan for public safety. That is still under consideration. I will tell you what we did is exactly what we would do if we had a separate pay scale. We compare market, we position ourselves in the market. So the, the math or the logistics of, of doing this would be the same whether we had a separate pay, pay scale or we worked within the existing. In the interest of doing this, 
uh, you know, in a timely manner using the existing pay scale right now lets us do that and we just we just adjust within that as, a, as opposed to going through and creating a, an entirely new one. Doesn't mean we won't do it and might not want to do that uh, even as soon as this budget, the new budget. Uh, but at this time, doing it within the pay plan, the existing pay plan, I think gets us there faster. And like I said, it's the same mechanics and analysis that brings you to those, those salary points that we just talked about. There is an issue within uh, the department looking at the pay, relative pay, and uh, quite frankly, incentive to promote from sergeant to lieutenant. Part of that difference is one is exempt, meaning you don't get paid overtime, and one is non-exempt, which means you get paid overtime. But it's not that simple. There's other elements to it and other responsibilities that are put on it, and, and the lieutenant position has some unique features to it, and not all lieutenants do the same type of work. You have folks that are on uh, shift and working that element, and others that are working uh, leading specialized aspects of what we do as a police department. So there are just some differences there. That is something we're still looking at with an eye towards, you know, a, a fairness component, but also how do we make sure folks that are really capable, good leaders, want to step up and lead, don't artificially stop that progression because of those differences. So we're still working through that, and I'm still getting some feedback on that, quite frankly. And so we want to keep keep working that issue. As I shared with you, Chief and her team did an analysis that said it, it costs us $129,330 to replace a police officer uh, with all the elements of training and equipping that we do uh, for a, a new officer that's uh, filling a vacant position. We are also reviewing the pay grades for every non-sworn position within the police department. That has already been initiated and is, and is ongoing. Uh, we are doing a similar exercise looking at the fire department, uh, the other element of public safety, with that same target of comparing ourselves to the market at the 90th percentile benchmark and seeing where that puts us. So that work is ongoing. Uh, we've had some initial meetings, but we're still gathering data to look at that. Both the department and HR are working on that. So um, stay tuned. There's more to come with that. And uh, as I shared with you previously, my goal would be, and we are due in the next budget cycle, not this budget cycle, but fiscal 26, to do our compensation plan full review and update. It would be time to do that. And so when we do that a year from now, uh, we would look at that that improved target of that 90th percentile across the organization and see where that puts us. And, and like I said, some places there, that's a, a significant adjustment. Some places it's not so much because we, our, our 75th percentile was always a floor. So there are areas we are going be above that. So there's not as much difference to the 90th and others, there's a little more. So that will, we'll have to do that full analysis to understand that as part of a, a comprehensive review uh, when we develop the budget next year, next cycle. Um, I'll stop there. I'd give Chief an opportunity if she wants to add anything to this. Uh, our HR team has worked exhaustively on this. There are people in this room from the department that on their own initiative worked exhaustively on this. I want to thank them all for that work. Uh, we're trying to make sure we're in the best place we possibly can be. So let Chief speak to it and then we'll take any other questions you have and see what direction you want to provide us as we move forward. So, all right. Chief? Thank you. Appreciate you listening to me tonight. Um, you may have noticed a few of my best friends are here. <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> um, last Friday, I swore in a new police officer after he completed three months of training at the State Academy. He will now begin six months of field training and a year's probation. Next Friday, I will swear in four more new officers. They've also completed three months of training at the academy. And yesterday I sent two young police officer trainees to the academy and they will graduate in June. Each of these young officers represents a major time and monetary investment by the city of Franklin. As Mr. Stuckey mentioned, it's about $130,000 for every one of those young men that were standing in front of me. We've tested three times this year, and we have a fourth test date, April the 25th. 
we continue to recruit throughout the state of Tennessee and nationwide. But everyone is hiring law enforcement officers, and we have vacancies. We are in a continuous whirlwind of recruit, test, train, repeat. This has become time, labor, and budget intensive. The demands on and for police officers continues to increase as Franklin grows. Please hear me when I say this. This request is my number one most important priority. Working for the city of Franklin provides a number of benefits, as you know, and opportunities regarding career advancement and training. The most important benefit that I will say, and these men who are here with me tonight will be mm -hmm. the public that we serve and you, the support that you give us. That's the most important benefit and we know how blessed we are. The Franklin Police Department has always been one of those agencies that other agencies chased. We were always in the lead and we need to be there again. We've got to catch up what we pay our officers in order to recruit and retain those officers. Now this is important. What Mr. Stuckey has said tonight, what he's presented to you in this awesome presentation and slides is a game changer. And for that, we're truly thankful. I can't emphasize enough how important this is, not only to us, but to the people we serve and more importantly, the future of the Franklin Police Department. Having a fully staffed professional police department is the reason we enjoy low crime rate and a quality of life for both our residents and the visitors who come here to enjoy. It is why businesses are attracted here and why they continue to thrive. I often say you can build it, but people won't come unless they feel safe. I have a hardworking, dedicated, smart, and very brave group of men and women who work at the Franklin Police Department. I will always have their back, and I'll always be their voice for what they need and what they have to provide for their families. This is critical. Your consideration of this compensation proposal is greatly valued and appreciated. Thank you for letting me say this. Thank you, Chief. So the specific proposal would be to come before you would be an adjustment in the pay grade system. It, was, it would essentially move all the police sworn positions up one pay grade. That would really be the action the board would need to take. Within that, we would implement the policy of a trainee pay starting at 60,000 and a lateral pay starting at 65. That all fits within those ranges. So that's really something we can do within uh, those elements. But what the board would need to act on is those adjustments in the, the compensation plan and how we slot those positions from uh, police officer, police officer trainee all the way up to captain. Those, those ranks would all bump a pay grade in, in respect to doing the pay grade then, along with that, each of those individuals would get a 3% bump. And then uh, the police officer ones, we would make sure all post-certified officers are at least at 65,000. So they would get that 3% or that move to 65,000, whichever is greater um, within the police officer one rank. Mm. So that's, that's basically it. If you're comfortable uh, or wanna give that direction tonight, I would bring that to you at our next meeting and we could implement it as soon as the first pay payroll in May. Uh, and then chief can also roll this out working with HR in our, um, in our, uh, our, our recruiting efforts and, and, and talking about what, what it's like and what it, what it brings here uh, from a compensation <laughs> standpoint, along with the other quality elements of who we are and how we work in this community, uh, which, which chief referenced. So, um, I'll stop there and answer any other questions you have and, and, and see what guidance you want to provide us tonight. Well, thank you, Mr. Stuckey and Chief. Thank you for bringing this to our attention and uh, uh, 
I, for one, when Chief Faulkner speaks, I listen very carefully, and also when our citizens speak, that safety in our community is a number one priority. I listen too. So, uh, thanks for bringing it to us, Alderman Berger. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for bringing this to us. We are way behind the times uh, and have fallen, fallen down on this. And it's uh, about time this was brought to us. And I really appreciate all the work that was put into this. Um, I know we're not living in New York City or in the crime-ridden areas of Chicago. But when something happens here, your lives are on the line. And you don't know when you stop a car or something happens, you don't know what's going on. You don't know that that person is meaning harm. And honestly, I would double this if I could. We can go out and drill for oil tomorrow. <laughs> if we strike oil, I would double all of your pays. Um, because our community is only what it is today, not because of what all these boards before us and, and now do, but because of the safety of our citizens, because of the priorities we put on our public safety through fire and police and then our services. Bottom line, take away those things and we're chaotic. We don't have a healthy city. So um, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate our police and our fire departments and all the men and women that work within those departments. Um, I would say, there's three questions. Uh, how many vacancies do we currently have that are not filled that could, could be filled under the budget right now? I have 11 vacancies. Wow. I have two officers who have been deployed overseas, and I have two on light duty. Two on light duty? Two okay. on light duty. Two out and two out. Okay. 15 all day, or 11 okay. minus four. The four in the count. I have 11 vacancies. 11 vacancies. Uh, what, what is the um, typical shift of, of numbers of officers on a shift? Usually it's around 18. That counts the supervisors. Okay. That's so they can rotate days off. They're not all on duty at the same time. Um, you know, they work four on and three off. Okay. So we rotate that uh, to give them their four days off. So okay. they're not all there all 18 right. at the same time but okay. a minimum staffing is eight officers okay that's minimum for for a shift okay um the other thing uh two more questions uh is there additional training that we give our officers and that we pay for and send them uh to become a detective to be trained in SWAT or other positions of skills Absolutely. They receive their certifications. When they're promoted, they, they take on additional training as well. Our SWAT officers all the time, our uh, negotiators, even our peer supporters go for additional training. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And there are certain certifications that they have to renew each year because they do a train the trainer. For example, firearms, uh, all of their uh, less than lethal weapons, such as their taser, their mm -hmm. chemical spray, the defensive tactics, and most importantly, decertification. Uh, not decertification, de-escalation. De de-escalation. Oh, yeah. de right, sure. Yeah. Okay, and um, so I know we have, they have to have so many hours per month of firearms training and practice. Do we also require a physical fitness requirement that we know when our officers are out on the street, if they have to chase somebody, they're able to do that, or they have a physical fitness um, requirement that they each have to continue to meet as officers. We have on, ongoing wellness training. So yes, when they go through in-service, there is an hour, sometimes two hours on wellness, officer wellness. But is it required? What if they <coughs> fall short of that? Is it there is any, not. It's not required? No. So I'm wondering if we could not implement some kind of incentive for officers to meet that. I would like to see an incentive program for all of our officers to meet and, and, and done by the city because I think that's healthy for our, our officers. I know some other uh, police uh, departments and other places have done that and, and it's really helped the officers. Uh, the other thing is, um, do we have a requirement um, 
for when we do all this training, get post-trained, post-certified, and then maybe we do SWAT or detective training, everything, do we have any requirement for them to stay with the city for so many years after we have spent the money to train them? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Well, we, we do that with um, degrees stay. when folks get uh, the tuition reimbursement and they receive a degree. degree through the city. There is a yeah. scale through which if they leave right. within a certain period of time, they, they have, have to, to pay, it pay us back. It's, it sort of declines over time, but they right. pay us back a portion of that. With training, we don't do that because training is something we want to provide for our people as a baseline as we develop them. And so we, we don't have that same standard. Okay. Um, we just haven't done that because we want to mm. we want to continually invest in that part of well, what we do for people. I, I don't think that it would require us not to continually invest or hurt that kind of program. But I would really like to see us have some kind of requirement when we put in a ton of time and money through tax dollars to train our men and women into SWAT, detective, whatever fields that they're in, that we require them to stay an appropriate amount of years according to the training they receive. So it might be, an, you have to, we're not gonna train you and then six months let you go. Yeah. You have to stay a year. Or possibly if the training is extensive, maybe we put two or three years on that. Well, I just yeah. think it's wise to do that. Well, we, we can't require someone to stay in our employment. But we can get compensation right. back like okay. we do with tuition, but you, you can't make someone stay your well, employee. We might want to look at that. <laughs> I just want to throw that yeah. out there because I think it might be something worth looking at. At the same time, um, hiring these lateral officers, we benefit from what other agencies have paid mm -hmm. for. I've got a couple examples sitting here. One's oh, from the San Francisco do. Police Department, yeah. another's from the Brentwood Police Department, yeah. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and they received training there that those citizens paid for, okay. and by God, we're capitalizing on it. Okay. And I do that a lot. And with this additional money for laterals, we will really benefit for that. So we will They bring a lot team. with yeah. them. They're already rolling onto our SWAT team. Okay, so we, we have more hope in doing this program to retain our fine officers. Retain then. and also steal. <laughs> I'd like for us to keep moving yeah. on and, okay. and quickly get a That's comment all my if questions. the rest of the board members want to make a comment <laughs> because we've got a lot of That's other things on the agenda. So Alderman Plant and I'll recognize you and then we'll just rotate this direction. Great. Um, I'm very, very excited to see this happen. I do want to thank Chief and specifically Officer Quinn for all the work he's put in this alongside everyone that showed up today. Um, I wholeheartedly support a public safety pay structure. I know that we are doing something that's a little bit off the beaten path by looking at this out of cycle from our normal compensation study that we do. Remind me the schedule of that. Well, Every it, how many years do we do that? Three to four years. And then we got off track next year would be, yeah, yeah, exactly. It went around five with what happened in COVID, both what that caused in terms of uncertainty, and then it just messed with labor markets the second year. So we couldn't do it till, uh, till when we did it for fiscal 23. So we would do it again comprehensively for fiscal 26. Well, but I the reality is we do some adjustments every year looking at where there are concerns so this, this is, is a big this, this is new this is particularly unusual but we do look at places where the market has moved away from us but i think if we're able to separate these these two departments it doesn't make them better than or more important than it is the bulk of our um employee base and it's a very important job that they play for our community and i think by having them separated from I mean, even the hours they work, the job they do, the danger that they're put in by the job that they perform is very set apart from um, some of the other job descriptions we have within the city. I think having it separated allows us to look at things separately in a timely manner. So if two years down the road, we had another spike, we don't have to wait till that compensation pay and market study research comes along again, mm -hmm. we can address that. Um, I think, and you've said it, Deb, and, and we've mentioned it, the key here is definitely recruitment, but it's also retention. And um, I know that we have not been as competitive as we needed to be, and we've lost some really good opportunities. We've had some people who we had already invested in for maybe decades leave us sooner than we wanted them to. And I look at a Scott Legaza, who's been with the department since the 90s, 
and you think about, and probably earlier than that, I apologize if I got it wrong, but <laughs> you think about us trying to continue to be a community that does community policing and relationships within our community to me are paramount. To have somebody that you can recognize and call out, it, it even increases that feeling of what Franklin is all about. So for us to be able to keep our officers and watch them rise through the ranks, build relationships with businesses and people and schools and all of those things that you all do so well, we need you to stay with us. I want you to retire, but I don't want you to retire at 25 years. I want you to retire when you're 70 because you love this department and this city so much. Um, my concern about retention is that is 3% enough. I don't do this for a living, so I can't really challenge you. But what I do is I think of the analogy of our COLA raises that we give are two and a half percent. This is a little bit more than that. So is it really enough to make a, the needle move? Um, I would be concerned about that. Um, I just, I'm so glad that we're doing this because police and fire are one of those things that you don't know how much you need them till you need them. And we need to continue to have the best mm -hmm. of the best. And we have great leadership in both of those departments. And I will call out to Glenn Johnson and what he's done with the fire department. Um, and Bev, they are doing a wellness program. So we've got one of those going on. But um, I wholeheartedly support this. I still think there might be a little bit of room for improvement. But this is a step in the right direction. Let, let me address a little bit. the. the the numbers show the 3% puts us at that 90th percentile or better. So it does do that. And these folks were still have the opportunity July 1 for market adjustment and uh, performance-based adjustment. So this, this, this will build on, this would be a step, and then there'll be additional uh, compensation adjustment at the first of the fiscal year, which would be July. So I just, and again, I don't do this for a living, yeah, but I'm, so I'm concerned about compression yeah. as you get higher up in those ranks. And you've got somebody who is a tenured officer who's not that far above somebody who just got this mm -hmm. really nice pay bump, mm -hmm. which they deserve. Mm -hmm. But morale mm -hmm. is also an issue. Lord knows people should not be talking about what they make with each other, mm -hmm. but it happens. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I think we can probably... Uh, it, yeah. When you say four hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, like that's a lot, mm -hmm. I'm like, what? I was I was expecting it to be a much larger price tag, um, and they're worth the much larger price tag. Thank you, Vice right. Mayor. Um, well, first of all, thank you for moving with some urgency to bring this. Um, I appreciated our conversations about it, and and you seeing the need. Um, you know, I agree with you. You got to kind of take the the bite of the uh, whale one bite at a time, and um, you know, we're not going to get it all done. And I think moving this part forward faster was really important, so we could be at parity. Um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with uh, these ladies and gentlemen, and um, you know, I, I want to say for their for their sake, what they've have communicated, they want to be competitive. They want. They want their brothers and sisters around. They want to have full full shifts. They want to they want to have the people they need. They want to keep great people, but to a T, every one of them also expressed how much this community. They feel the love of this community. They feel, they love the training they get. They love the leadership they have. There's a lot of good that we do for these officers in our city, and they recognize that. So I just want everybody to be aware. Every conversation I had with them wasn't just about we just want more money. It, it was a recognition of how good we treat our officers, um, but. They want to, we, we got to take care of them and we got to make sure we can keep them and we can get more of them. Um, on the, um, and, and if you look at, I, I know it's, I know it's an increase, you know, we talked about the 8% earlier that we did in 2022, you know, on the private side, you're seeing increases of four and a half to 5% every year. And so uh, uh, fast outpacing the non-private sector. Um, and, and if you, it, even recent, I think only 55% of most private employees are even past uh, an increase past post or pre-COVID. So we, we dipped down and we're just starting to get people back to where they were at COVID. Because our increases don't come as often, I just don't want to be at parity. I'd like to be a little bit of bump ahead so that we aren't once again having to have these conversations. I appreciate that in July, there's going to be that other opportunity and that we'll continue to look at it. But like you, I, I too, I'm like, 3% is great. And I'm grateful that we're doing something, we're doing something quickly. 
um, but an incremental percent and a half or so that gets us above parity and gives us some breathing room while we're working things out feels right to me. Um, if this was on my budget ranking sheet that I just did, uh, this would have been number one, and I'd have left off two through nine if I had to um, to make sure that this was this was fun because I think this is important for our city. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't mind that. I too am a big fan of uh, and in favor of a public safety sector uh, looking at police and fire pay separately. Um, and so I would like you to continue to continue to look at that. I think it's important. Um, However we look at that percentage, the one thing I do want to look at is when we make that change for those officers that are maybe, let's say you got somebody that's six years in, <clears throat> we bring somebody in at 65 now, if that's really close, and I don't know how many of those there are, there may only be a, a few of those, but I would want us to take that look at, are, we, are there any close proximity there where you've got some people who have been here five, six years where this it's going to be pretty close now to somebody coming in year one because of that increase that they're going to get at a starting pay. And maybe maybe instead of the across the board, at least let's look at some of those pain points and make sure that we're and that's really in taking that. an individual look. And, and that's would really largely be in the police officer one Correct. Yeah. range. Yeah. yeah. And I, so just, if we yep. just take a look at that and just mm -hmm. make sure there's none of that in yep. there. Uh, otherwise, in, in full support. And uh, I do appreciate you moving with some urgency here because this was important to get done. So thanks. All Thank right. you. I won't say, I echo what they've said, but I have uh, time. I'm not going to take the time to restate what has already been said, but I fully agree with the things that have been said. But Chief, is this, but the thing that maybe not what has been said is, I think when I think about like um, strategy for our department, like is this going to give us the tools to have like are we uh, the most qualified, culturally aligned um, candidates that are available in our market? Like, do, is this going to make us the bell of the ball as far as opportunities to do law enforcement in our in our area? You mean the pay the increase? The pay changes by itself. I, I do think it's a game changer, and I think it will help us attract uh, women and minorities. Because I think, um, like when you're built, you know, if we shifted down to the right in the, in the scale or in our uh, against our peers, and one of the things when I did I did meet with with the uh, officer team is, you know, it, some of it was about money. Obviously, it's, this is all about money, right? But some, but but when when you really listen to what some of the things they have to say. <laughs> It's about the right people. It's like attracting the right people that require the money, but it's it's the right people who want to be here, but maybe they can't make it financially work, or maybe there is another department that is a lesser, you know, doesn't really fit their desire to be with a top tier department like we are, but they're getting paid a little bit more. And so I don't want to lose out on the culture that you've helped establish and build uh, that that those long timers and short timers too that are, are building and so if, if this is it if this is going to make us the most attractive for the highest qualified candidates both lateral and new and it will only be for a window of time right because the market will shift and i know and like that's what's going to happen so we'll be here in another year and a half and 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 we may mm -hmm. um it may evolve but if you can tell me wholeheartedly that this is going to increase the the level of applicants um, that even, you know, makes us even better. And now that needs to be our strategy, I think, is making sure, is, yes, it's the money, but is it, if it's 750 or 450 or whatever the total number is, like whatever that sweet spot is so that we're getting more applicants of higher quality that we get to choose from, mm -hmm. that's the goal. And if it's 90%, if it's 95% of the, our peers, <laughs> Look at the look at the. I want to know what the applicants are looking like in a, in one year. I want you to I want you to let us know that yes, we are seeing demonstrated higher quality applicants in one year. And it may or may not be because of this, but you would hope to see that higher quality applicants are applying. We do track applicant pools. But and you know what I mean. I yeah, think that exactly. to me, we will we we will continue you know, to monitor that. And yeah. so, a year year and a half from now, like that's the metric I really want to look at is, are we. Are we getting to pick and choose the best of the best? The other thing we've been doing some analysis on is not just how many raw 
applicants you get, but how many, when they go through the process, qualify or hit, hit the, the mark that we want, that we would want to offer. And so it's kind of taking it all the way through the process. So we're doing some additional analysis on that, and that would be really interesting to look at a year from now, six months, a year, two years from now. Um, and, and we have changed our philosophy to be much more open, both Chief Faulkner and Chief Johnson, to the lateral. We used to very rarely do laterals, and now that is very much part of the mix. So uh, all of that continues to evolve, but that is something we are monitoring. And you're correct about our high standards. Uh, education is something that we key in on. We know that's important to this job. Um, having someone who can connect with anyone, um, no matter who they are or where they're from. Majority of our officers have baccalaureates. Many have masters with two doctorates, and I have one finishing law school right now. So it's, it is something that is achievable and it's encouraged. I want in the, in the talent pool of applicants, and I'm finished, man, after this. But I want them. To, I want. I would love for the chatter to be at the police academy. Well, if I don't get into Franklin, yeah, then oh, I'll. Me too. You know what I mean. But if I don't get into Franklin, then I'll go to Brentwood, <laughs> or if I don't get into Franklin, I'll go to wherever. Like mm -hmm. I, that needs to be the culture in the marketplace, and it, and that comes with pay. That comes with culture. It comes with different things, but that's you, we can't measure that. But uh, that's the goal. Thank, Thank you, Alderman you. Bag, Alderman Peterson. There's so much that's already been said. I just want to uh, say how much we appreciate and how much the citizens appreciate all that you have done to make this place the place that we live. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Alderman Caesar. I think on the surface, this is about money, but really these guys aren't here asking for the money. They're serving our community and it's up to us to continue to equip them so they can live the life that they want to live while they do the work that they're called to do. Um, the folks that I spoke with that about this issue are not here seeking a raise in the way that some others may. They're here wanting to be competitive. And this is an important piece, mm -hmm. Chief Faulkner, that I'd like you to share. A police officer that comes to work at Franklin has to go through the training but once they complete that training, they can go on to the open market to another community mm -hmm. that's paying five or 10 or sometimes 15 or 20% more. That's, that's accurate, right? Yes. And so we not only have to do a great job of attracting top talent, but man, a 15% raise to go to another community would be really enticing to somebody <laughs> that's, that's making you know, a, a police officer one level pay. And I think we have to be mindful of it. I support the work that you've done, Eric, the team behind you. Chief, thank you for bringing this to us. I support our fire and our police officers, the police that we're talking about here today. We need to be that destination for our first responders and the people who are going to be running in in our times of greatest need. And I hope that this is at least the beginning of a conversation. And I have one final question about this um, Eric, you had talked about the potential to look at different uh, grading scales for the folks who are in our public, uh, public yep. service areas. Are there, help me understand before we get down that path, mm -hmm. I think it's an important path for us to, to explore, but in other areas outside of fire, police, first responders, are there the type of incentives and overtime packages that come into consideration mm -hmm. for other areas under the city? Yeah, and, and there are diff different nuances to different roles and professions and so we try to look at that in terms of career path in terms of uh, are there certain certifications that we greatly benefit from that deserve some additional consideration so we look at all those different total packages just like we have elements you look at this chart that have uh, pieces that relate to stipends and other elements uh, incentives that might be there so there's little nuances within different pockets but we also try to always have a consistent look at the market and use the numbers that the market is showing us that positions are are being paid at and then then target where we want to be compared to that so whether we do a separate pay plan or not, we're still going to do that work that says, where's the market and how do we want to compete in that market? And are we hitting, in this case, a refreshed, enhanced target of 90th percentile or better? And so that that work will always be there. And that is a consistent effort that happens. And I, I understand there are some benefits to pulling it out in terms of uh, just just having a focus on it and understanding it. But we'll continue to do that work 
whichever way that goes. Um, but we do look at that with each position and how we compete. And we've made adjustments in the past, too, to make sure we are responding to what's going on in the market. This one changed very, very quickly. I mean, 18 months ago, we were in the position we're talking about moving now. And now we've got to restore it. And so we're just going to continue to need to continue to keep an eye on it. Um, this is going to be a really challenging market. We have, you know, I, I think I shared a labor report with you in the last week. Lowest unemployment in the states, Franklin, Tennessee. That's a great thing. It says a lot about our local economy, but it also says it's harder to find the right people <laughs> because everybody's competing for the talent. And we're, we're in that same boat. Um, I'm fully supportive of this. I hope that I can continue to support Chief Faulkner and the team behind her in being competitive and retaining our top talent. Thank you. Alderman Potts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alderman Barnhill, it's almost nice to hit cleanup down here. Everything's been said. <laughs> Always nice. <laughs> You've got a smaller broom to sweep now. There you go. I, I yielded my time to Alderman Baggett and uh, Alderman Brown and Blanton down there. So uh, I, I'll be quick. And it's um, I, I do need one piece of data verified. Uh, I was told that 30 percent of the department and the 30 percent is what I'm sticking on. 30 percent of the department will be within two thousand dollars of each other at three percent. And if that's the number, I just want us to take a look at that at our next pay cycle or pay review cycle to see where we are on that. And that's um, and I know, Eric, you've already looks like you've already put put a comment to that. So uh, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I want to make not sure. everyone in the department but within two thousand dollars of each other. So that's that are you talking about within a rank within a rank? Is, I, I'm trying to understand your question right, so we can so that, answer. That's what I want to make okay. sure is this at this 3%, <laughs> when you do this 3% bump, what will the compression look like? Well, everybody's getting the same bump. Right. So the compression doesn't worsen. It's the same as it is today. Everybody gets the same adjustment. Where the compression could happen is I think what was identified within the PO2 rank. That's if we have the same, yeah. we have a, a common floor. Right. Some move differently. How are they compared to each other? Somebody that's been here who just may have gotten to that or close to that, where are they going to be? That's where you could see it, and that's the analysis we'll need to do. Good. And it's something, again, we can do, you know, we can do within the pay grades to, to address it. That's what we did about a year ago with about a million three throughout the organization to address it. It, did, it wasn't perfect, didn't address everything, but it did address it in some in some ways. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to look at that. And I think the specific one is that police officer one component. We'll need to look at that. Okay, good. Thank you for yeah. addressing that and continuing. To As I understand the issue, if there are others mm -hmm. that can help clarify for me, you know where I am. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, I'm also in support of this. I think this is great. We appreciate you and uh, Chief Faulkner and everybody that's been involved months ago sitting down with Officer Quinn and several others. Um, it's Eric, we, we appreciate the nimbleness that staff had to mm -hmm had to come about to get this done and and to implement it possibly in May. Uh, but this is a time that we've got, uh, as our officers are set to protect and serve us, this is our opportunity right now, both as BOMA, as City of Franklin administration, and as our city to protect and serve them as uh, we want to retain the best people possible. So uh, I appreciate you, Chief Faulkner, and everybody that's here tonight and everybody that can't be here tonight. Clean up, man. I'm going to make mine a little shorter than some of the rest of them. <laughs> I've heard that before. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, but yeah. you listen, then we'll, then you yeah, can Yeah, I'll judge. judge it afterwards. I certainly support what we've discussed. And, and the one thing that I was a little surprised at, I, I would have guessed that $475,000 to have been a little higher mm -hmm. on what we were doing. But, I, you know, I'm delighted with that. But you're also looking, when that 3% kicks in, then you're also looking in July 1 of going back and that 3% also gets the increase of whatever the increase is for the city when we redo when we redo all of that. So yeah, so it's a little bit of a double double take right there. But no, I have no no qualms whatsoever in looking at this right here and making sure that uh, we're attracting and retaining the most highly qualified best police officers that we can. And, you know, I was sitting here thinking, you, you guys, 20 or 30 years ago, 
you probably were not facing what you're facing now when you're going out someplace now because, I mean, we don't, we as civilians, we look and read, and everywhere we turn around, there's somebody, you know, harming a police officer. I would encourage you as much as possible, and you know that, and I think the saying is that at the end of the shift, you want to go home. That's what I would be making sure that you were able to do, and I'm going to make sure that you have the equipment that makes it as safely as possible for you to do your job. So I certainly support this. I don't have any qualms whatsoever. I know we've talked about this. I've got some of this. I've, I've got more of this than what we've got on the board up there, but uh, I would like to see this happen. And then you say that you can do it by May, this is April, May. Yeah, if, if you vote, if, if I bring this to you, adjust the pay plan accordingly, uh, you would vote on that on uh, April 23rd, and then we would put it in place for the first payroll in May. Okay. So that would be the next available time to apply it. So. But once it hits the papers, all those people applying by April 26th will know what they're in store for. There's some people watching this presentation. <laughs> There's several I've encouraged to watch it that were applicants and they were kind of on pause because it wasn't worth it to them financially to make the transition. And I said, don't withdraw from the process. Wait until you hear how we're supported by our mayor and aldermen and our city administrators. So, yeah, I'm sure they're listening. And, and I just wanted to mention to you, Alderman Berger, I know you've probably been in our building. We have two amazing workout areas. We have a weight room, and then downstairs we have a cardio room, and we're constantly adding new equipment. And you come in 24-7, you're probably going to find one or two or three of these guys. Look at them. They're all bulked up. I mean, they're in there working out. <laughs> they know the importance of preparing to hit the streets and being all they can be, both mentally, physically, spiritually, and, and they work very hard to be that special officer so i didn't want you to think that we don't take advantage of that equipment and um and they do work hard and we just had a carson challenge jeff carson the last two years since jeff carson passed uh there's been a a, a challenge which amazes me what those officers did to uh, compete in that um they're more than fit they're pretty amazing both male and female were participating so thank you very much for all you've said today Thank you, Chief. Did you have anything, Mayor? Did you have a question or anything? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm all the, aboard. <laughs> this, this was an amazing response, and I can't tell you how much it means to me and, and the officers that work for you at the Franklin Police Department. Thank you, Mr. Stuckey and Mayor, and each and every one of you. Your comments and things that you have said to all of us here, we take to heart, and uh, I'm sure they'll carry it back to a roll call tonight. My amen section over here. Um, <laughs> it's extremely important to us what you think and how you feel about us. That's what we work for. So thank you. Well, I'm going to ask that we move on to the Sanitation Environmental Services Department cost of service study, but as they come up, I'd like to give our officers that are here a round of applause. <laughs> Ryan has to stay. <laughs> Finally, we get to do this. We've only put you off two times. Did Nate say I'm not coming, Jack? Because he knew it wouldn't happen. <laughs> So I appreciate your time this evening. Um, we have been working uh, past number of months on a cost of service study for the Sanitation and Environmental Services Department. Um, you may remember uh, Chris Franklin down in the end. He's the Public Works Operations Analyst. Um, he, Jack, Nate, uh, put a lot of time and effort into pulling this together to present to you what the revenue requirements are for the department, um, knowing that in the past handful of years, there's been a number of pretty big shifts, which we'll, which we'll go through during the presentation. So with that, uh, Eric, unless you have anything, we'll kick it off. Take it away. Thank you for having me. I just want to say thank you for not bumping me a third time. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we're going to start off with, first, what is a cost of service? Just the general rundown. Um, a cost of service is an approach that we use to determine customer rates based on 
revenue required to fully recover operation maintenance and capital costs. So the goal of this study was to understand what revenues we need to generate in order to meet our expenditures and have a self-sustaining fund. I'm going to hand it over to Jack to give a little department overview. Yeah, this is an uh, opportunity I have no opportunity I enjoy because I don't get up here very often. Uh, to just kind of give you a rehash of last year, some of you heard this in the budget uh, review, but I'll go through this for those that weren't present. We consist of three divisions. We have administration with 10 personnel, collections has 32 personnel, and disposal has six personnel. That's transfer station. We have 48 vehicles and pieces of equipment. Fiscal year 2023, we processed 25,809 tons of residential MSW that uh, our city team collected. We processed 60,204 tons of commercial MSW that came in through the transfer station, 2,579 tons of recycling, 2,265 tons of brush and yard waste, our current monthly residential rate is $23 a month. We have almost 25,000 residential accounts. And I think there was a little over 19,000 when I started 11 years ago. Our current city of Franklin transfer station tipping fee uh, for commercial haulers is $65 a ton. And I can tell you we processed over 7,000 service requests from people calling in uh, asking for some additional service or or whatnot uh, in fiscal year 2023. And we still, 2024, we're still remaining in the top 10 most dangerous occupations in the United States according to OSHA. I think this year we dropped to number seven, but we're usually consistently in the top five. Uh, and that's just some facts I wanted to share with you guys, and I'll give it back to Chris. Thank you. So the first thing we did for the cost of service was to understand the revenues that we have coming in. Uh, in, in the SCS fund, there are two main revenue streams. There's residential revenue and commercial revenue. Residential revenue uh, accounts for approximately 58% of all revenues. And that, essentially what this is the, is the approximately 25,000 accounts times $23 per month times 12 months. So that's approximately $6.9 million. The commercial revenue is generated from commercial haulers coming to the tipping station, uh, to the transfer station, using our transfer station to dump their trash, getting charged uh, $65 per ton. And this accounts for approximately 36% of all revenues. The other 6% is like late pay penalties, uh, blue bin setup fees, seller surplus assets, just and, and that can fluctuate between three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars a year, it just depends on how much we sell, how, how many new blue bin setups we do. Uh, when we look at total revenues on this chart, you can see that um, pretty it's all pretty much commercial and residential revenue. Now in the actuals 21, 22, and 23, you'll see a big discrepancy between residential plus commercial and then total. That's because there were general fund transfers in those years. So when we're projecting in the future for revenues on this chart, we didn't project any general fund transfers. We simply did revenues generated by this fund. Um, for the residential revenue, we didn't calculate an, any rate increase. This is just increases in customer accounts, residential accounts times $23 a month. For commercial revenue, we factored in um, going from 65 to $70 in FY26 and 27. And this is to keep up with our increases in um, getting rid of that trash at by county our new tipping fees at by county so we have to ensure that the commercial that our tipping fee at our transfer station is high enough to to make that equitable you know for us to make that equitable for us to do that for them um and then going up to 75 and 28 and 29 and then as i said there's a uh, approximately 300 to 500 thousand dollars in additional revenues um next we moved on to expenditures there's three areas of expenditures, personnel, operations, and capital. Within personnel, since FY 2021, because of all the, the um, 
pay increases and compression, and we've filled uh, three uh, vacant positions, added three new positions. We've seen a 37% increase in personnel, uh, numbers. Um, operationally, uh, over half of all of our operational expenditures are, contributed, are attributed to municipal solid waste disposal costs. And with the new contract with Bi-County and MBI hauling, that's expected to go from 3703 and 21 is what it was to 6624 by FY 2029. And then we have capital costs, which are basically we have 48 pieces of vehicle and equipment that we must maintain and replace. And so this, this cost is this a yearly average of each one over time. When we look at total expenditures, you can see how, how drastically we project them to increase from FY21 to 29. And that's attributed to exactly what I just explained, the personal, the raises in personal costs and the raises in uh, uh, landfill fees. These personnel projections include 5% for salaries and wages, 7.5% for, for benefits, and 2% for all other expenditures. When we, the next chart is going to show us. Can, I, can yes, we go back yeah. to that real yes. quick? So you'll see in estimated 2024, the total capital expense is two, roughly $2.6 million. Um, that's attributed to um, generally side loaders that have been ordered two years ago, and we expect them to come in this fiscal year. So that's when they're going to hit the books. And so I just wanted to point that out because it's a, it kind of jumps off the page. So anyway, thank you. To, to that point, in the future, we don't expect to spend exactly that each year. That's just an average over time of what we would spend over that five-year period, and we just split it up among the years. Um, the next chart is revenues versus expenditures. So this clearly shows the revenues we expect to bring in and the expenditures we expect to, to continue our operations. As you can see in the past, we had surpluses uh, up until 23, but a lot of those were due to the general fund transfers. So every year we've had a general fund transfer, including 24, we've already had $750,000 worth of uh, transfer. If you look projection into 25, 26, 27, you can see that we're we're getting a bigger and bigger deficit as we are right now without any increases in um, monthly rates. One but, thing you may notice here, you'll you'll see a couple years where we have a surplus in the fund without the general fund transfer, but we still have a general fund transfer, and that is because we've got to hit a certain fund balance per guidance from the comptroller in the state of Tennessee. So, for example, you'll see a year where the, the you, you may have had revenues and expenditures roughly in balance or even a little bit of a surplus, but to get to that fund balance that we needed to have, we had to provide an additional transfer from the general fund. And for FY24, if we don't do any more general fund transfers, we will use 2.5 million of our approximately $3 million uh, SES, or SES fund balance. So we'll be down to about $500,000 in that fund. It's going to necessitate another general yeah. fund transfer because yeah. you'll be below the minimum. Yeah, yeah. Minimum. yeah. got to maintain the minimum. So with all this, we see that in the future we're going to have a deficit. So we have a couple scenarios here for you to think about to see how we can alleviate this situation. Scenario one is the status quo. It's keep the rates the same, increase the transfer station tipping fees to 70 and 26 and 27 and 75 and 28 and 29, and then just cover the deficit with a general fund transfer every year. Scenario two is the rip the bandaid off approach. It's go straight to the number we need in order to be a self-sufficient fund. And that requires us to go from 23 to 31 in FY25 and then increase $2 a year every year after that until FY29 will be at $39. Scenario three is a little bit more of a moderate approach. We're going to go up $3 a year until we get to $38 in 2029, and they'll be self-sustaining at that point. And then the fourth one, the fourth scenario is during the cost of service, we did a little side thing to see how much brush costs, because a lot of cities in the area, their brush pickup is not part of their sanitation department. It can be part of the general fund, like public, their public works department will do it, or their streets department will do it. So we took it upon ourselves to try to understand the cost of that service. So this scenario would assign that cost to the general fund. So essentially there'd be a general fund transfer every year 
to cover that cost. And then we would set the rates based on to provide recycling and municipal solid waste. And so in that scenario, on the, in the left column, you can see the general fund transfer to assign to brush would be 1.04 starting in 25, and then it would increase 3% each year after that. And our monthly rates would go up $3 a year until FY27, where they would be at 32, and then $1.50 each year after that, where we would stop at uh, $35 in FY29. <laughs> so how aggressive are we on the on the brush now? If, if it's a commercial person that cuts it, we don't pick it up. If we can prove it. Yeah. Okay. They're they're required to remove the brush. Do what now? They're required to remove the brush per our municipal right. code. Yes. And we do our best to to identify if it's a, you know, a service that has been used or or what. But it's really difficult to, you know, if you have I would a service think it'd that comes be extremely out. difficult. Yeah. So. So. Does that does that figure into your cost of brush assigned to? column where you've got a million forty five thousand dollars for 2025 essentially for this we took personnel and equipment and assigned certain uh, operational expenditures to the brush pickup fund not necessarily total brush pickup but per, but that plays into it because the more brush you have the more people you need and equipment you need so we didn't necessarily it wasn't specifically uh, part of the analysis but it's it's by default included in the analysis yeah. because we're we're using the personnel and equipment to do this work, um, kind of parsing out the, the the work that was done privately is not really possible for us to do. So I hope that answers your question. It does. It's a little. It's just it's a little discouraging for someone who's living in a high HOA fee, and the HOA takes care of that. But you're paying through the HOA fee, which is much higher than it would be if it, if you didn't have all the other services mm -hmm. going along. Then the one person who's living on that half acre lot someplace can cut a bush, bring it out, and have it hauled off. And the person that's living in the HOA is still paying for it mm -hmm. in a taxpayer rate paying. Yeah, one thing we've done to enforce the brush collection in recent years is that there's a limit to the amount of brush we would pick okay. up on any given week. If they exceed that, then they have to pay for it. And I don't recall what that number is. It's Jeff. quite a bit. It's, it's 125 a, a yeah. load. So, From what I understand, what won't fit in the back of a truck. Yeah, if you exceed the truck, it's it's 100 and something mm -hmm. dollars. So we've been enforcing that. Um, simply because we don't have capacity to, to do all that work. And there's, of course, suspicion that some of those instances, you've had a, a private service come out, cut down trees, haul it out to the front, and expect the city to pick it up. Yep. So exactly. Yes, sir. What, what kind of data do you have? I mean, what kind of, like, how much information on this brush picking? Because I, I do think that this is an interest. I'm not interested in this scenario, but I'm interested in the idea of, of some assignment or, or understanding the cost of the brush. I don't think it should come from the general fund. I think it would be more along the lines of possibly another revenue collection method for brush. Uh, I, I don't like the idea, as, to, to your point, Alderman Barnhill, like if it comes from the general fund, the people in the HOA are paying for it out of the general fund too, because exactly. it's coming through their mm -hmm. sales taxes and property taxes too. So. I like the idea of coming up with maybe some, and this doesn't have to be immediate, but I like the idea of, of a cost assignment for the brush, but not this scenario. Um, also, the second question, while I've got the four, this, the, 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 the cost of 3703 for uh, by county, we're making a margin of 30, you know, 30 bucks, you know, 50% on that right now. And it seems to me i'm just kind of curious about the market and like what i know we're getting a heck of a deal right now mm -hmm. um so i don't anticipate that we would make a 50 percent margin on the commercial hauling uh when it goes to 66 but also maybe we would get more than ten dollar uh ten percent ten dollar margin uh in 29 than we're we're scheduling to do here between seven or nine dollar margin 
I think the market, I'm just, I don't know the market well enough to know. You all do. But I, I think that, and maybe 75 is what you all have figured out, that that's what, before people start leaving us. Mm -hmm. But if, if we're, we're able to get it at 66 and that's, and we're a, a big time, you know, customer, probably getting some discounts. I think you negotiated it well, this last deal that we just got. No one else is going to be, get, be able to get it cheaper and closer. And are these commercial people really going to leave? I'd rather put the tipping fee up higher, quicker for the commercial if it's not going to, you know, mess the marketplace up. Because if that's 30% to 6% of the revenue and, and you pass the, some of the, and you pass that savings on to the customers, I'd rather see an in, a quicker increase on the commercial tipping fee mm -hmm. if it doesn't throw off the market and people start choosing to do different things. We've had conversations about that. We think there is concern that if we go higher, too high, too quickly, we will lose customers. We did have a, a large customer start going to a landfill that they own this year, um, not necessarily exclusively, uh, but we did lose that volume. I don't know necessarily because of our tipping fee, but the solid waste industry is very complicated and they're going to identify the ways to do things cheaply. Now, the, the transfer station that Jack and his team run uh, is probably one of the more efficient um, ways to drop off your waste. So going to our transfer station is probably a lot easier than going to a landfill, for example. Um, we expect that customer to return. Um, I don't know Jack can speak to that better than can I. The, the, majority, the majority now are smaller haulers that come to us. They, they account for a larger percentage of, of our daily volume, uh, especially since one of the large companies stopped coming and I knew they would. They told me they would if we went to 70 and frankly they can afford to do whatever they want to with their waste. And, uh, we can't control that. Um, but I do know the market is going to change drastically in the next couple of years uh, with landfill problems uh, in Merceboro. Uh, they're, they're on borrow time and if that closes that's 6,000 tons a day of MSW that's got to find somewhere else to go which is why it was so important for us to make our arrangement with Bi County and, and we basically make up the volume that they want to receive uh, so we, we kind of cornered their capacity um, so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for a revenue stream when that happens uh, there's some real cheap quick things we can do transfer station to more than double our volume that we can take and push uh, we've got some more a few more hundred tons a day we can send to Bi County under our current contract uh, built in so the opportunity I think is coming uh, for revenue stream there uh, I'd be hard pressed to right now put that burden on our small haulers that are coming in which is who would be paying if we go up again right now uh, I think they all understand that's part of business and that's what's happening but uh, I think we're in a good spot right now and I don't want to push that commercial in too far yet. We're, we're going to keep an eye on it. Yes. And we've been aggressive in the past. It wasn't that long ago that this number was 45, 50. Yeah. And so we've moved yeah. it when we saw the opportunity in the market. But we want to, as you hear from Jack, we're trying to look at the right balance. We have done some things that enhance our capacity. The compactor system that we just put in both uh, provides that additional capacity without having to add to the building and also is improve the efficiency and the cleanliness of the operation too. So it's, it's been a great win and I applaud the team for that, but we're going to keep looking at that because we know that's a great opportunity to lessen the burden on our ratepayers where we can. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to come back in within two to three years and have this very similar conversation because things will change. Um, and probably less than two or three years. <laughs> probably less than <laughs> Every three years. Every year we'll be looking at this. Wait, wait, that's just one very quick thing as a little bitty part of this. Uh, last week we had somebody come in and uh, 
cut back uh, some of our trees and everything, they hauled it off themselves. See, and so uh, there's still people who do that, but I, I've seen some other places in the area where they, you know, right around me where they haven't done that. And the hardest I, group to control is a small landscaper. You know, while they're cutting yard, oh, we'll trim your bushes and put it out. So he'll pick it up, and, and that's but, hard to catch those those folks. But but as I say, this this, this guy took it all off. But I can't oh. say our volume of brush stays pretty consistent. It, it's two and a half, three thousand tons a year, pretty consistently. So you know, we can like educate the public better on our website. Everything about that. Yeah. We should get Melissa and people to, together to educate the people better on that because a lot of people don't know that. They don't know it's driving up costs. So if they hire a service, mm -hmm. we need to tell you. If you hire a service, you need to ask those people to haul it off. Yeah, and I think we need when to, these programs well, in we need the to were created, they were created with the mindset it's brush. It's just trimmings from weeds and brush. Well, it's grown into a tree removal. Yep. <laughs> Did you have a comment, Alderman Blanton? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Don't look at my list. Half of this was the last time. <laughs> um. So for those of you who have not been on the board long, when I first got here, we had a, a big decision where we um, we let go of our own drivers driving our trash away and we had the the um, contract with by county and I fought really hard to not let that happen because I was concerned about our employees losing their jobs thankfully we were able to yeah, no one lost their job I'm not done <laughs> thankfully we were able to reallocate and transfer some people and it all worked out so by county has been a part of our equation for about 13 years but what I'm noticing as somebody who grew up here the services are starting to be more fragmented, but the rate is continuing to go up. And that concerns me, not only as I continue to age, now I'm not that old yet, but when you watch your water bill, which is where this bill is encapsulated, go from 50 to now 100 to now 100 and whatever, we really have to consider our people who are on fixed incomes. And I think trash service for you, Patrick, is not the same as trash service for me. When you've got two people who live in a house that might generate one bag and you've got three little girls, I'm not saying they generate, but it's, it is apples, <laughs> it's apples and oranges. And I think sometimes it really concerns me um, as we try to continue to make this an enterprise fund, which I know we are held accountable to do, how, I mean, at what point do we strive so hard to make it be what it needs to be? And and I do not want to privatize our trash I, or our waste or sanitation and all of that. I don't want that. I don't think that's what's right for our city right now because I think in the long haul, no pun intended, the more services that we surrender to outside entities, the more we don't have control of the quality of life in our community. Does everybody grasp that? You know what I mean? I mean, if we're, if, you know, I call the sanitation department because they forgot to pick up a bag, or well, that's not even a good analogy because we're not allowed to put a bag outside like we used to because now it's a buck a bag. <laughs> so all things being relative, I think we've got to really get creative and also we have to take care of the people who can't afford these what seem like little incremental charges that make them go without maybe, you know, whatever they need for that week. I think that if, if you know, how do we come up with the cost per customer for the service? What does it cost for you to just pick up my trash? Yes, I got a recycle bin when my daughter moved back into my house because she's a recycler. I don't put enough in there to fool with it. So I've got an empty can out there that I'm not getting charged for, just the setup. But I just, I, and I, again, we play Alderman on TV and we don't work Jack's job, but I just, I can, I am concerned about how we continually go up incrementally to make sure that we're reaching our responsibility as an enterprise fund, but our services are not the same as they were even 11 years ago. 
and our staff is going up. Our cost for staff, yes, we want our people to be paid well. Jack, this is another one of those very important departments in our community that really makes a difference in our quality of life. But um, I, I think that if people want to use our transfer station because it's, it's easier for them to drive out to the landfill or wherever else they can dump it, whether that's there used to be certain places. And I know those landfills are getting more and more rare and just hard. Um, at what point do we outprice our citizens from the service based on trying to keep a department alive? And I, again, um, that is yeah, not my heart's desire. But this, this price, the pricing that we're talking about is significantly lower than what a pri what a private entity would provide. I have an uncle who's in the trash business. He made well, his life in it. And Spring Hill private trash is cheaper than well, what we if, charge. If you go to Brentwood, they're paying easily $40. And they're, they're not, uh, and they're not getting near the service we provide. I understand, but our services continue to start fragmenting. So, so I, the I, service, I want to understand that better because we're providing every service we provided 11 years ago. But some of those are now add-ons. Help me understand what that okay. is. Okay, um, a truckload of brush that's from my house, from maybe three trees I have. If I exceed a truck bed, then that's a hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty-five. Yeah, I think that standard was always there. We just may not have enforced it. But I, I'm just saying we we have provided a comprehensive level of of uh, solid waste services. I agree throughout, and and the simplicity of having, and that's part of the policy decision for you all to think about is we have rolled that into one fee because it's a really high level of service and people will say I, I put it out I pay the one fee and I'm good <coughs> whether it's trash recycling the brown bag the yard waste the you know the brush all that gets taken care of so that's been the philosophy because it's simple and it's a high level of service oh we've been and given incredible you, service yeah if you want to start breaking it down it, it gets more complicated and it also is hard to know how that plays out from a revenue standpoint and you start you start to actually fragment what you ask people to pay for so I, but if, if you've got if, a if you want us to look at that old we, woman who yeah. lives and i to say woman who lives in one of our smushed together condo situations mm -hmm. and she has one bag of trash mm -hmm. and she's paying the same as what patrick's paying for a family of five sorry you're easy because <laughs> i know you have young children Maybe we have a program where we've got somebody much like Karen Paris does at the county and the trustee's office that we have a way for them to try mm -hmm. to get some relief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, I, mm -hmm. I want to be concerned for all because these little incremental charges to me today is not a make or break, but somebody else, I mean, maybe part of that is a I don't know, some way to offset for people who are on a fixed income where a 70 or 80 or $100 plus is, and they're using a minute, same thing for water, same thing for trash, and I'm not, but mm -hmm. do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a threshold based on usage for people whose income is fixed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It just concerns me mm -hmm. because I get it. Um, we continue to try to make this work and and i do think we do a great job and it's a wonderful department but at what point do we hit that tipping point of where privatized service is going to be a better opportunity alderman barnhill well the water and sewer we pay for usage for the amount of usage mm -hmm. there's also a minimum right okay the minimum amount of usage whichever what this is just a fee that somebody pays one person pays for that fee mm -hmm. so i'm not sure it, this is an enterprise fund no no nah. this is it, it's not a, a it's, water not official, it's not officially an enterprise fund but the general direction has for it to be more self-supporting has may, been the direction it, we've followed for and I'm fine, many years and i'm fine with that because i think i'm that's been the what i've looked at mm -hmm. and supported from day one i know we used to have an alderman who said he wanted to put this into the property taxes because mm -hmm. the property taxes were an itemized deduction on his income tax. Mm -hmm. I doubt if that made much difference on his income tax one way or the other. <laughs> but but I, I, your outside horror, your commercial horror, is not picking up in the city limits of Franklin, is it? No. No, not typically. So we're, not so residential. What, so what, 
So what that's going through then, your City of Franklin station tipping fee is all outside of Franklin coming into Franklin then. Or it's commercial. It's a commercial no. entity. We have so. commercial haulers who operate in Franklin for commercial properties. And then you have residential and Trans commercial outside of. So Franklin. would we see that pickup truck going down and clumpy highway mm -hmm. loaded up, it's falling off the sides? Yes, sir. It's headed to you. Good enough. Were you through with your presentation, Chris? Yes, sir. You got I have another? one more slide I was going to throw it down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of where we would recommend, this is where this discussion is really relevant. Because the recommendation would be to continue to make it a self-sufficient fund or move towards that. Both options two and option three show you a path to do that. Three phases it in, two gets you there more immediately. But the idea is, if you don't, you're going to continually put more and more strain on your general fund which is where we pay for these other base services. So it's, it's that key policy uh, decision or direction that we need. And we do have costs that we see escalating on the horizon. So we're trying to identify that. And we said option two, and I said option two, because that is the cleanest way to keep it uh, self-sufficient and to lessen the burden on the general fund. Uh, but option three also provides a phase in and a known time period where you'd have a, a, a general fund subsidy and, and get you there over a longer period of time. I, I think those are generally the, the places to go if, if you would like us to explore some kind of offset, something like the senior tax relief. That, that again, turns into a general fund obligation. So you know that's the trade-off you're making in terms of providing that, then lessens your ability to do something else that's on the list. Uh, of, of other services or enhancements you want to do. So, and again, that's the that's where the policy choice comes. So if, if you can help us with that guidance, we are in a position where we know these costs were, will continue to escalate pretty significantly and to give us the guidance of how you want to see us structure rates as we build a budget now and in the future. Um, you know, this provides that framework for understanding a five-year window of supporting this service. So that's where we need that guidance so we can start formulating uh, in the budget something that reflects that. And if there's additional work to do on that, we, we certainly can do that and maybe take an interim step as we look at some of those options to respond to concerns we've heard tonight. Well, you looking for that? I'd love that direction as much as we can have it so that we put a, build, a budget forward that you are comfortable with. So we know we're giving you all this tonight. We can circle back uh, if you'd like to uh, as well. But, but that's, it's a key component as we, we start to think about not just this year's budget, but the next several. Right now, I'm supporting scenario two, so we're down the line. Scenario. Uh, I do have a question. Good. Sure. Uh, my question is, and we've talked about this before, is uh, when we have talked about the weight of trash and things like that, we have then explored glass recycling. So uh, are there any plans somewhere in the future to have any type of glass recycling? Because, and again, to Alderman Blanton's comment, this is kind of one of those one-offs again, right? But this is also weight, and it's another option for us. So. If you could bring that back to us, we don't need the answer tonight necessarily, but uh, I would like to see that and know where we can go on it. Uh, yeah, scenario two right now. Yeah, and, and glass recycling is a difficult right. challenge mm -hmm. from a contamination of other recycling and the lack of a market for it. So that's just, Alderman we Street. hear that and we continue to look at that. I don't have a scenario at this time that I'm supporting. I need to talk Alderman more. Peterson, Alderman Berger. I'd support two caveat. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you want to? No, I, is where we supposed to say? What yeah, which one? I, I, yeah, I guess two. Um, with a caveat that I do think we can get creative on, or making sure that this, we make sure our commercial people are paying their fair share, their, their their way, mm -hmm. and I think making sure that if we reduce, I'm not going to go into the details. Let's talk after, but. Anything to shave the increase off the, the individuals, if that's a brushing, some sort of brush, you've heard the comments, but I would support too, with those yeah. kind of thoughts. And it doesn't have to be solved before I vote on it, but moving that direction. 
I, I like this the spirit of number two, um, but I don't like those later increases. I, what I'd what I'd say is I'd be supportive of making a making a step towards it. But I, like Brandy, I, I get calls every week. I, I've got a lot of older neighborhoods. I've got a lot of folks who are empty nesters. I've got those single individuals and I get those calls on water and trash all the time. And, and I do think it disproportionately hits some of those homes um, that are, you know, one one woman living at home, the very little trash and very few showers and, and uh, well, normal showers, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that probably wasn't right, but you know what I mean, less water usage. So uh, I, I do think we need to we need to think about what that looks like as you go down through here. And I, I'll also say this, and um, th this won't be a popular comment across the board, but we've got, we, we seemingly are having a lot of these discussions where we're just behind, you know, it, it was water and it's trash and it's our roads and we have all these state routes and, and the state's not doing much to help us out. And we've just got a lot of needs and it does feel like we just kind of keep nipping it at stuff on these different fees and and uh, at some point um, and and you know whether it's political courage or it's um, it's just thoughtfulness here I think we have to start looking at how are we going to move this city forward um, it, it, you can't just shut down all growth and assume that that's going to be the answer because that isn't the answer the costs are just going up across the board and at some point we're going to have to be able to take care of our people and have the quality of life that we need and I don't know if uh, you know incremental bumps in fees every year is really the efficient way of doing that. And so um, at some point we're going to have to get our heads together and maybe spend more time on really thinking about how we're going to fund our city and our services and our quality of life as opposed to some of the other things that we talk about every day. Alderman Blanton, you have a preference? That was some political courage right there. Good job. Um, I really, I need to look at it a little bit further. I mean, obviously I'm the stand apart here and it is not malicious at all. It's just... You know, it's one of those things as we continue to try to take care of our city and I know the costs go up, how are we balancing how that's appropriated? Um, and on the heels of what he said, I think that when we talk about the general fund and all the ways that that is populated, I don't necessarily love the idea that we are proud of the fact that we have the lowest property tax because we are the most desirable place in Tennessee. And at some point, I don't think that needs to be the jewel I want in my crown. And I think incremental, you didn't say the word, but I do think that it's gonna take leadership from us to make sure that it's proportionate across the board, so. Quick. I would just say that I'm not opposed to looking at that, but we need to go to our citizens and talk to our citizens. Because sure. sometimes people say, well, if you raise, like we did, raise taxes and we said, do you want us to do it? We got favorable uh, responses because so much was going to transportation or roads, infrastructure, and so much for general. So th that's what we have to come down on because we have roads to build and we have things like this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not all bad to outsource stuff either. And I'm not opposed to that. If you look at Sandy, and I just sent you all a link. Sandy Plains, Georgia, and I've visited there. They did their own, they, they pretty well started with the blank slate. You're probably very familiar with them. And they start with the blank slate. And I just sent you that link, take a look at it and see what they've done. They've done some marvelous things. And sometimes you have to say, what's the good of the city? Not always because we should keep our departments because people lose their jobs. We do. Times change. Sometimes you have to improvise and you have to implement new strategies in order to be lean and mean and to run a city the way you should run it. I'm not saying we outsource it. I'm saying, I know we do. But the thing is, sometimes we don't really have those tough discussions up here about what we might need to do in the future. Item three is a capital improvement plan update process. Thank you, Jack, Chris, Mark. Thank you all. I won't take a lot of time on this, but I wanted to get your response or get you thinking about our way forward on capital investment program. We've we've looked at the the menu, if you will, that we had from uh, staff's review. Uh, you all added projects that you saw in the community, so we went through those. We've also done this exercise where you identified what you might be willing or interested in reprioritizing. So I think that's the next step is to to bring to some conclusion what you want to pull out of that plan for potential reprioritization. So we did sort of a poll that we shared with you last time. I'd like to circle back and, and maybe drive to some decisions on that, what you want to remove 
because that will tell us what within the existing structure we have capacity to do. Uh, and that may lead to further discussion of what you just talked about, is where we want to be in terms of what supports what we do operationally and in terms of capital projects. So that next step would be solidify the reprioritization. Then from that, you'll have a sense of what your capacity is to apply to that menu of projects, both that we had identified previously and that we added to the list and, and see how far that goes. And then there's a discussion beyond that about um, capacity and some of the other solutions that might help us address those. We talked a little bit a month or so ago about some of the other uh, financing tools that are out there that how could those line with with some of some of the needs we're seeing um, as well as maybe the potential of of, of the broader picture uh, of both the capital projects but also how we support uh, operations long term so that's kind of the way I have it in my mind that we would come back to you with the idea of kind of locking in where you want to be on on pulling things off of the prior off of the previously done priority list uh, just so that we know where to put our time and energy and then you can look at how far your priorities go within an updated plan and then you can look beyond that in, in terms of any other discussions and, and getting further down that list and, and so that's what I'd like some feedback on. Right, Mayor. I, I, just one comment here on on the list is um, and I think this is kind of emerging here a little bit one of the Probably one of our biggest pain points are all the state routes that we've got. And I'm not trying to pick a fight with mm -hmm. Nashville here right now. Maybe I am. Yeah. Um, we, and I don't know if everybody understands that, that most of our road needs and expansion and all that is mm -hmm. they're, they're state routes. And yep. the city has traditionally not yep. funded improvements on state routes. Mm -hmm. If we're not going to get funding, mm -hmm. we need to, we got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we can just sit here and wait and hope and pray that someday they send some money down to fix some of these mm -hmm. state routes. So. If now we have to consider a policy change on how we're going to approach mm -hmm. all of those roads, where's that coming from? How does that how does that sit separately mm -hmm. from all the other projects and all the other things that we would normally tackle? Mm -hmm. Now you're loading that on there, and I don't know if there is um, discussions to be had where hey we're going to go and we're going to we're going to chip in early. Can we get a bigger commitment from you later? I I don't know what those discussions yeah. can look like, but we are at this point where. We can't just not do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before, but sometimes chipping in doesn't get us anywhere either. I, we, yeah, and we don't know. Way, we don't know with certainty how that plays. Uh, 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 that's the challenge. But I hear you. Yeah, we that's figure out definitely something because we're at a point yeah. where that's what really needs to be addressed. And, and may I say too that if we start chipping in, that's one. Way. And we've done that before, and and sometimes it works, but it took forever to get it done and just chipping in is not going to give us any guarantee that they'll even come on board with sure. us at the state but if we start doing state routes then there's going to be city streets that are not going to get right. done because we're going to go do state routes that's a dangerous slippery slope to go down even though i agree we probably need to look at that but then that's ching ching that is a tax raise yep. So if you want city streets done and you want state routes done, that's definitely a tax raise. No, I'll tell you, though, this is, I agree, but the patchwork of city street projects that we will have to put pull together over the next 20 years before Mac Hatcher and Northwest Second Bridge is done, before the Southeast is extended, before Franklin Road and Mac Hatcher is, is improved, before Hillsborough, I mean, just continue down the list. The, the patchwork of city street and, <clears throat> excuse me it's city street improvement projects because people aren't going to go those routes because they're going to go city streets and those are going to get overcrowded and we're responsible for those this is the this is the trade-off and I would I would support looking at those state routes like kind of looking at our capital uh, investment plan existing with our capacity that we've had and not adding to or, and having to remove from that before we add to them, before we add to it. Mm -hmm. and But but taking out, like, we're all going to say we want Southeast Mac Hatcher done. I mean, I would guess. Every, maybe not. I'm not speaking for everyone. Yeah. But I think everyone would say that. Yeah. That's how much, uh, that's like eight, $70 million in that budget, CIP budget or something. I can't remember. Well, that's clearly, we're not going to, like, fund that out of city funds right now. So pull, the, like, kind of look at what we know we can do. And then we're going to have to, I think, tackle this, the T dot and the state route stuff um, separately, and 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 figure out, be guided by you all how that strategically can happen. And maybe it's, 
I've heard, and I think the mayor has worked very uh, strongly with the MPO and the, is, is in conversations with, the, with TDOT, and so is Eric and staff. Maybe next year there'll be more money, and we don't know that. Yeah. But we got to do something. Uh, so that would be my suggestion. Well, I, I think that uh, let me stop the Debbie Downer just a little bit on our roads because I think there has been a lot that's been accomplished with TDOT and that they've said we're going to change the way we're doing things. We're going to get projects done. We're not going to go do a bunch of engineering and then let it sit on the shelf. So they've identified uh, projects that are going to get done within the next 10 years. And sadly, uh, we're not in it. We've got 31 in there. and We've got 65 designated as a potential uh, choice lane. So next year is another opportunity. We'll continue to work. And uh, uh, I've advocated for some time that our system of funding roads in Tennessee uh, has worked for many years, but I think we've moved past where it works anymore. It's obvious that we can't keep up with the uh, maintenance needs and we can't keep up with the needs as far as uh, building new roads. So I think the state needs to be exploring other ways to fund roads other than gasoline tax and the billion and a half dollars they get every year. Every year. So um, I don't want to get too choked up on that. I need to move on. <laughs> so which is uh, another reason to choke up for me personally is discussion of the Southeast Park naming. You know, there, we've had a lot of buzz about the Southeast Park. We're excited about it. We've seen the plans. We've seen LEG's playground. Uh, we bid the bridge. We got the bridge built. And now we're in the bidding process, putting a package of things together to get the Southeast Park uh, bid. You know, many of you uh, served on the board with Alderman Bransford. Uh, and many of us were elected for the first time when Alderman Bransford uh, came on the board. Uh, certainly, she had a record in our community working with the Franklin Special School District. She had a very special place in our community as far as community activism. Uh, she had a special place in my heart because she was an operating room nurse, and we were able to talk doctor together and have that same language. Um, you know, I think one of the things about Pearl is she was not a complainer. You know, Pearl served uh, in her... Uh, in the days when she was becoming terminal with her cancer. She didn't share that with any of us. She shared with me just fairly shortly uh, before her death, and we talked about it. Um, the big burden that I had after Pearl passed was trying to fill the shoes. I mean, I couldn't believe how many committees she was on, how much she was doing, and her capacity was uh, unbelievable. So I would ask the board to consider, uh, as we look at Southeast Park, consider naming that park for Pearl Bransford and call it the Pearl. Uh, I know that there's not a lot of time for a lot of discussion tonight on that, uh, but I would be a strong advocate for that because uh, of so many things that she did. Uh, so uh, I think Eric may have... Uh, had some brief discussions with some of you, but I would encourage you maybe to get back with er Eric uh, if that's a direction that we'd like to go. And uh, so we'll keep moving on if that's okay. Um, item five is progress report on resolution 2023-49. Joey? I'll keep this very brief. Uh, we're good with that. Um, we fulfilled our obligations uh, for the uh, plan of services for this property that was annexed by referendum October of last year. And I can't answer any questions if you have any. Item six and seven we'll consider at the same time, which is a rezoning and a development plan uh, for um, the Meridian South PUD subdivision. Baggett, so I don't know where we're going to fit in. The 7 o'clock meeting? Oh, okay. That's all right. It was a citizen comment period. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Just want to make comments at 7 o'clock. She was invited by Baggett. Everybody with a red
they'll need speaker cars. While the map's loading, this is where the Hilton is, at the corner of Cool Springs and Carruthers. I think everyone is aware of that location. I'll keep working on the map while we talk. Um, the rezoning for this property is adding 14,000 square feet to the existing site. It's 4,000 square feet of retail and 10,000 square feet of office. The development plan included six MOSs, one for parking, five for signage. Three of the six MOSs staff recommended approval of and FMPC agreed with a unanimous vote of six to zero. Those are for parking, irregular shaped signs, and additional flag signs. There were three MOSs that were not unanimous. Uh, for monument signs, the applicant was asking for additional height, quantity, and area. Staff recommended disapproval. Oops, there it is, Matt. Staff is recommending disapproval. The Planning Commission recommended approval for those interior to the development only. So the two monument signs on the exterior, one along Cool Springs, one along Carruthers, they recommended that those be excluded from the MOS. That was a vote of four to two. The MOS for convenience signs, these are directional signs throughout the development. They are asking for additional height, quantity, area, and illumination. Staff recommended disapproval. Planning Commission recommended approval five to one. The MOS for directory signs, the applicant was asking for changes for every regulated component, which was lo location, height, area, and illumination. Staff recommended disapproval and Planning Commission recommended disapproval five to one. I can go into our rationale for those if you'd like, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Seeing none, we'll continue moving forward. We'll go to items number eight and nine, which are rezoning and development plan for the Caroline PUD subdivision at 101 Cool Springs Boulevard. Y'all are playing a lot of <laughs> musical chairs. <laughs> Joey, are you the... I will be. Yeah, so this is a uh, new development called the Caroline PUD subdivision, uh, approximately um, three acres in size. Okay. Um, there we go. And is located east of Mac Hatcher Memorial Parkway and north of Cool Springs Boulevard. Um, at 101 Cool Springs Boulevard. The proposed development uh, consists of 190 multifamily units and 3,607 square feet of commercial space. Uh, Envision Franklin places this property in the regional commerce design concept. Uh, the proposed development meets mi the uh, minimum recommendations of Envision Franklin um, and the specifics for the uh, regional commerce of design concept. Um, just so you're aware, uh, this may sound familiar to you. To you. Uh, a similar proposal at this location uh, went before Planning Commission uh, at the June 2023 meeting of last year, where it was recommended for disapproval to the Board of Mayor Alderman uh, due to the traffic impact analysis. That project was then uh, removed by the applicants or withdrawn. Um, we have since revised how we review our traffic standards uh, for the area, and with that, uh, new review process, we can support uh, as staff both the rezoning and the uh, development plan for the Caroline PUD as uh, well as Planning Commission also recommended approval. So happy to answer any questions. So we have the applicant here. Um, I think Greg Gamble wanted to speak on the behalf of the applicant. Is that correct? Very quick. Yes, uh, my name is Greg Gamble. I'm here with uh, Jason Ritson who owns the property uh, as well as um, Mitch Reckler with Reckler Equity group, uh, Jay Sheridan, uh, Kimley Horn, and 906 Architects, if you have any questions for us. We have um, redesigned the master plan. The property um, will be known as the Carolyn, which is out of respect for the matriarch arc of the Cross family who developed much of Cool Springs and Cool Springs Boulevard. Um, so this would be an appropriate bookend for Cool Springs Boulevard. Uh, it is three stories along Mac Hatcher Parkway. It transitions to four stories as it uh, moves down um, Cool Springs Boulevard toward the six-story building. Uh, beyond, there are two <coughs> levels of parking that are going to be below the building underground. We have 
uh, kept a lot of the components of the master plan that uh, we heard the Planning Commission and the Alderman um, uh, that we received favorable uh, comments on. Uh, we have added to the master plan, um, or I guess kind of um, uh, transformed the master plan into a different unit count that includes 12% studio apartments, which is 22 of the total number. Uh, it's still a boutique um, building with only 190. Uh, it includes 10,000 square feet of club and amenity um, spaces and square footage, and uh, 3,693 square feet of uh, commercial square footage, which, whoops, sorry, my boards, it's just easier to see, um, which we have uh, added on the, the hard corner of the main entrance. So we brought the commercial up to this main level where it's on this pedestrian uh, sidewalk of Cool Springs Boulevard to really activate the street um, and really provide a different character. Um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. I don't have a question. I just want to applaud your stick to it mentality. Um, I think it's to be wonderful to activate the um, pedestrian pathways that, that go below Roper's Knob and to Mac Hatcher and continue to provide connectivity and, and the amenities that are within to and being um, sensitive to the market and providing that smaller footprint, which allows a lot of opportunities for people who don't need the picket fence, but they want to be in Franklin. So I, and I like the redesign from the color of the black and the yeah. white that right. is everyone's choice right now so yeah thank you I'd, I'd say ditto to everything you just said plus the design is what you came in with is here what you came in tonight with <clears throat> is here it totally fits in franklin it looks great across the street from ropa's knob and with all the walking and the bike trails that we have there then you're going to activate that even more yeah alderman potts yep thank you mr mayor if, Greg, if you'll pull that other horizontal up, um, I appreciate you guys bringing this back to us. I know the first time that some of the buildings that were there were very concerning. This has more of the Franklin feel. Um, and I also appreciate, uh, as we continue to talk about Roper's Knob and protecting that vista, um, that it appears that y'all have been much more sensitive to that. And I know that in meetings you've presented that as well. So, um, and then it's below I think the midpoint uh, as it relates to to Roper Snob. Yeah. So thank you. Okay, we're going to keep moving on. We're going to go to City of Franklin Contract 2024-0060 with Bridges Domestic Violence Shelter of Williamson County amount of $175,000 for the purchase of a home that will offer transitional housing to families moving back into mainstream living funded through the Community Development Block Grant. Any questions on that? Next and is... I, uh, I'll actually, put a comment in there. And actually, I'll let actually, oh. actually, Mayor, and I, items 10 and 11 are both routine uh, CDBG contracts, but I would like to highlight on item 10, the contract with Bridges. Um, that is a new partner for us and a slight, a kind of new type of project where we're actually helping them acquire a... They happen to have an opportunity to purchase this property and appreciate y'all enabling us to move quickly with voting on this tonight to help them purchase this this uh, property. And, and I would just say Bridges is a service that is provided in our community that we do not have that has to happen because our police officers go out and pick up the people that need to be rescued and we have no place to put them. So actually that's a partnership that we have to have in our community. And I will mention, uh, Kathleen Salcida was unable to be here this evening, but she has done a lot of work consistently with Bridges on trying to help them on this. So just to mention her in that work. And the address is not given because of the fact of you're trying to protect the victims. Yep. Um, uh, is, what do we have left balance-wise in the uh, community block grant? Uh, after these expenditures, there will be a, uh, just for, for our current funding a little over a hundred thousand dollars so and of course next next program year we'll hopefully get another allocation yeah and tom i just thank you for mentioning kathleen i want to thank everybody that's been involved in that i've been on those calls as well and this is an excellent excellent opportunity here for franklin 
and Linda's out in the hall. And uh, thanks for bringing up item 11, which was the $250,000 for reimbursement of the expenses associated with the Cherokee development. So we'll keep moving on. We'll now go to items 12 and 13, which is City of Franklin contract 2024-0103 with CNT Engineering for construction inspection of the 36-inch Hobos emergency pipe repair and also the contract with Garney Construction for construction of the 36-inch Hobos uh, emergency pipe repair. So we, I had spoken to you about this two weeks ago in terms of this had just emerged a few days before uh, that meeting and, and we now know the costs or estimated cost of repair. Um, you've got two items here. You've got a construction inspection uh, arrangement that does need your approval tonight. The construction, you're really acting to acknowledge the actions I took on your behalf with this being an emergency action. Uh, I, I will add, I think Michelle can maybe color this in a little bit more, but we have seen a reduction in cost in that repair because of, of uh, ma material cost for the pipe. I think it's reduced around $200,000 uh, potentially there. So we knew that that was a potential that we might be able to get the pipe a little bit cheaper. We're looking at that. We are replacing the reinforced fiberglass pipe with um, the cast iron. So. Um, the duct ductile iron, iron sorry. Uh, so that that will be a that will be an important improvement. So. Yeah, so we have, um, so the cost for Garney is we, we executed, Eric executed that contract on your behalf because we needed to give them the okay to go ahead and start procuring the, some of the materials. The manholes was the longest lead time. Um, but we did have a call with them um, this past or last this last Friday and talked about how as a utility we could reduce some of those costs we're going to do the utility cut across Lewisburg if we need to and some of the fencing um, and and look at having a driver for some of those soils and um, that sort of thing so we are trying to make efforts to reduce that as much as we can but we did we did go ahead and authorize it for that just because of the procurement amount the time frame I, I would like to add we're, we're also evaluating um, the pipe upstream of this location as well just to yeah. Ensure we don't have yeah. additional issues. So, so I, I do have a question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and Michelle, I know that you sent an email uh, earlier today uh, yes. about the uh, a resident, the property owner that's right there, and that is part of that is used for cattle grazing. And for a couple of decades now, they've been able to get that topsoil set so that they can raise what's needed for the cattle and there's concern that if we don't put the topsoil back the way that it is that it will negatively impact the business that they operate regarding those cattle so could yeah. you address that yeah so we didn't um so that we didn't put that in the um i did respond back but you probably didn't get a chance to see oh, it I got so it right here oh, okay so we did we um didn't put that in the contract just because that's the 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 contract is the typical language that we have that is the law template that we use. Uh, but we do have the construction inspector who has, um, they did the 2017 Hobos repair, Hobos repair. So I have faith that um, we're going to address that and that'll be taken care of. We don't have, because of that, I don't have an exact trench width yet that we're talking with Mr. Crouch about that because we need to figure out some of those stabilization areas. Um, we have a pre-construction meeting this Friday where we're going to kind of hash out um, at our public works building to kind of look at to look at those exact ideas. Yeah, you know, the the work was actually the, the scope of the work was actually established. Um, really, well, let me back up. We did have a, a meeting with the property owner last week, and he did address that concern. Mm -hmm. and we acknowledge the concern. The contract was actually developed prior to that conversation, so we'll it's 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 in the forefront of our minds, and um, yeah. we'll uh, make sure that we address that. Okay. What about easements? So that's so that's part of what we're um, we'll need a temporary construction easement. The permanent easement we have is not sufficient for the trench and benching out we'll need to do. Um, so that's that that'll be part of that con that conversation on Friday to determine that. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. So it is it is it is working on. It's just moving. We want to make sure it's done right rather than super fast. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number 14, which is Ordinance 2023-41 concerning the road impact fees. We've been talking about this for some time. We're going to not have time to talk about it tonight. <laughs> so, As Paul uh, turns around. Uh, I know there will be a long discussion, Sorry, so I would <laughs> urge you to go ahead and firm up your opinion based on the, the documents you have on what, how you want to move forward on it. Uh, Next is a procurement award to Willis Towers Watson Southeast uh, doing business as uh, WTW of Nashville. 
for $75,000 for group employee insurance benefits. Any question about that? And then we have uh, two uh, uh, consideration of wine and grocery store license for TriStar Energy uh, at Lewisburg Pike. And thank you, Kevin. Your comments were enlightening. Uh, for Lewisburg Pike and Carruthers East. So uh, seeing nothing else, uh, no other business, we're going to adjourn, and we'll see you back as close to 7 as we can. <laughs>